good afternoon. It's a bit scary to be in Oxford. <laughs> See what a reputation you have around the world. But thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, to be here. I thought that uh, ministers of finance who get dismissed might not be too welcome, but uh, thank you for the warm welcome as well. And uh, I hope we can exchange uh, ideas both about South Africa and about uh, some of the issues that, that affect the world more, more generally as well. For, for people like yourselves, and I hope for me as well, South Africa is uh, in many ways a crucible where many of the challenges both on the African continent and uh, around the world play themselves out. And where uh, we are a 23-year-old young experiment uh, of democracy, of development, of inclusivity, of building a new nation, and of giving everybody, if you like, the same kind of pride uh, in, in, in our country, and hopefully becoming an example uh, of what social justice means in, in practical terms. That's the dream that Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Walter Sisulu, and their generation, and millions of people in South Africa have aspired to over, over many, many years. And uh, made huge sacrifices uh, in that process as well. But one of the humbling things about uh, our experience in South Africa is that, as some of you might have learned, there is actually no end to history. Uh, remember the end of history uh, from Mr. Fukuyama? And in fact, every day, and certainly in the current period in South Africa, there's uh, new, new lessons being learned, new developments that are taking place, that are testing some of the ideas that we've established in our country, but also creates uh, new possibilities, requires of us that we adapt to new circumstances, and new kinds of challenges and opportunities arise as well. I imagine the same is happening around the world as well. And uh, nothing remains too static for too long. Uh, whether it's the notion that globalization is here forever, uh, that uh, the current uh, financial system is here forever, and will be as dominant as it has been for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, or that inequality is a sustainable uh, element of any society for, for the long term. Uh, in today's world, in many different ways and in many different parts of the world, these notions are being seriously uh, challenged in, this, in, a, in a sense. It's interesting that 61 years ago, in 1956, under difficult conditions, um, South Africans from all walks of life formulated what some, many of you might know as the Freedom Charter. And in it, they described their aspiration for a democratic South Africa. And when I was a young activist in, nine, in the early nine, late 1960s, early 1970s, what attracted many uh, of us to the ANC and the Freedom Charter, of, the ANC of course was banned at the time, was the opening line of the Freedom Charter. South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white which is today contained in, in our preamble to the Constitution, which I'll talk about in a moment. 39 years later, in 1993, we went through a difficult period of negotiations, but a period of negotiations that the world marveled at. We didn't spill too much of blood as everybody expected, and out, out came, late November 1993, an interim constitution, which gave us the basis for the first democratic elections in April 1994. And uh, it's still a, a remarkable document that had the basic principles upon which our final constitution uh, was uh, formulated. Forty years later, in 1996, Mr. Mandela signed off on the new constitution of South Africa as, as the president of our, of our country. And I just want to read you a, a part of the preamble. Anybody here who can recite it amongst the South Africans that are here? So that's the one thing you might want to do to get a bit of inspiration every morning. <coughs> we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of our past, honor those who suffered, uh, who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our uh, freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the republic so that, one, we heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, 
social justice and fundamental human rights. Secondly, that we lay the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government uh, is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Thirdly, that we improve the quality of life of all citizens and face the potential uh, and, and free the potential of each person. And the last point I would end with is build a united and democratic South Africa able to take its rightful place as a sovereign state in the family of, of nations. Now, aspirations like this are not necessarily accomplished overnight. They are long processes of struggle, of contestation, of progress and of setbacks. In the ideal life, of course, all of us would like to see something like this uh, become an automatic future that is delivered to us. And often when uh, that delivery, inverted commas, doesn't happen quickly enough, we then despair and say, well, we are having difficulties. But in reality, these, thing, these elements and these aspirations need to be uh, struggled for. So we learned in the mid-1970s uh, from our neighboring uh, country, Mozambique, a uh, Portuguese phrase, a luta continua, the struggle continues. And in any democracy, the struggle will continue. The struggle between those who want things only for themselves and deprive the majority in a country where democratic systems begin to fail and don't uh, serve uh, all citizens in a particular country, where economies move in a direction uh, which actually doesn't satisfy the needs of all of the citizens of those countries as, as well. So in, in our own situation, I think we can proudly say we've created a new state machinery We've turned the economy around, although we are in a technical recession at the moment, uh, that services have been delivered and access to services has, has improved formidably in the last 20 years. But the next challenge, Aluta Continua, is to improve the quality of the services that we deliver and the quality of uh, performance of the state itself and other elements of society. We've created key institutions in government, whether it's the constitutional court or the fiscal institutions, but I'll raise some questions about those institutions in a moment as well. The process of nation building and reconciliation, which Nelson Mandela foresaw, is also a process that advances, stutters, advances and stutters. And there's been debates, as you know, if we are frank amongst each other, uh, about whether racism is raising its head again or not. I don't think it is raising its head in a formidable way. I think the majority of South Africans are still grappling uh, with uh, a future state where we respect the diversity of each of our people on the one hand, but see ourselves as one nation uh, at, at the same time as well. But equally, I think uh, we, we're going through a phenomenal phase in South Africa at the moment, where in the face of the challenges that we have, there's a, a huge level of activation of ordinary citizens, people who are aware of what is going on, of the dynamics that are actually unfolding, of uh, what are the good things that are happening, and if you permit me to be euphemistic, what are not so good things that are going on at the, at the moment. You'll catch on to that, I'm sure, very quickly. Um, and an activation of civil society organizations that have come to the fore over the last, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 18 months or so, and who are making their presence felt, and who are saying that the, the principles in our constitution and the aspirations that we have in our various policy documents in the country uh, are threatened in one way or another and uh, that they need to be struggled for so that we can sustain them. On the flip side of this coin uh, are some of the negatives that we confront, which I still believe don't overwhelm the positives that we've actually achieved. I attended a, let's call it a seminar for the last few hours before I got here uh, on fragile states and uh, it was a fascinating one. And the kind of uh, lessons to be learned from the South African experience in creating a new police service, in creating a new defense uh, force, in building a new state machinery out of all the Bantustans and self-governing territories that we had. For those of you that might not be familiar, we at one stage had, what, 16 or 18 departments of education that needed to be consolidated into one, and then nine provincial departments. Think about it. It took us about two or three years from 1994 to put that machinery into place and create a new, 
a new state. It still needs to work a lot more effectively, true, uh, but there are serious challenges uh, th that we've overcome and that we still need to overcome. But politically uh, today, we're becoming known for state capture, for the fact that uh, despite all the good things we've done and the various institutions we've created, there has been this insidious force uh, or group or groups of people who've uh, gained uh, an enormous amount of influence, whether it's in state-owned entities, whether it is in the enforcement arms of the state, uh, or in other respects as well. And uh, that is what the citizens of South Africa are becoming more and more alive to, and something that we intend uh, to more and more contest as, as well. As far as the economy is concerned, we've done well, it's grown, it's uh, created a whole new middle class, uh, more jobs have been created over this period of time, and until the Great Recession came visiting in 2008-9 from Wall Street, remember we were growing at 4% as an economy at that time. That recession had nothing to do with South Africa and the way we managed it. It had everything to do with financial regulation in the United States. But that actually, uh, the, uh, if you like, uncovered some of the fault lines that we have in our economy. And over the next 10 years, one of the serious issues is they still the marginalization and exclusion of the majority of South Africans from our economic scene, the concentration in many parts of our economy, the lack of small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, in a sizable number that will actually start, start changing uh, the character of our economy and the need to diversify and innovate in our economy in a new kind of way as, as well. And although the standard of living of many South Africans have improved over a period of time, we are still amongst the most unequal societies in the world, and that's something that we can't be too, too comfortable about. But those challenges don't mean that we must be depressed. Those challenges merely mean that we've got to work harder. And so I said to a, a group of you earlier on, I've come to Oxford to recruit activists who would come back to South Africa and help us to bring about these changes faster, more fundamentally, so that uh, we can continue to make a difference and uh, accomplish the aspirations that we set out for ourselves. But equally, we live in a world, uh, because South Africa is not an isolated in, uh, entity, where serious questions are being asked about globalization, about who benefits from globalization, about uh, the contest between growth, which uh, benefits the 1% or the 10% or the elites, and the 90% being actually left out, uh, and, and how do you innovate on new growth models that, that are actually required at this point in time, uh, on issues like climate change and whether we comply with global compacts or step out of them if you feel like tweeting early in the morning one day. Um, and in a sense, the more serious and fundamental questions are, are being asked, which I'm sure some of you might be working on, which is what does, what does a post-neoliberal society look like? What does a post-neoliberal economy look like? How do we actually uh, truly create social justice around the world, uh, including in, in a country like, like our own, let alone some of the challenges that we have on, on the geopolitical front? So let me conclude by saying that uh, South Africa is indeed our country, and we must take responsibility to make sure uh, that we bring about the changes that are required. We can't deny that there are challenges. The challenges are there for everyone to see. But at the same time, in, in, in looking at those challenges, we shouldn't actually shoot ourselves uh, uh, or treat ourselves too harshly and uh, recognize that there are many pluses and many foundations that we've created that we can actually build upon. It won't be easy to fight the forces of state capture. It won't be easy to overcome inequality. It won't be easy to get a more redistributive economy and a more participatory one uh, than we have right now. But then who said life is supposed to be easy? Uh, and that's why we need a new generation of activists to come along who would uh, take on our luta continua and uh, in a sense achieve the aspirations in our constitution and aspirations in the national development plan as well. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you for that. Um, you just ended your speech now saying you're here to look for the next generation of activists. What do you think effective activism looks like today, not just in South Africa, but um, around the world? Mr. Seto Stan. Your choice. Um. <laughs> At least you're democratic, so that's good. <laughs> <coughs> 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 Sorry for the coughing. Now, I suppose what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about, uh, coming from the kind of history that we have come from, is firstly awareness of the phenomena that are unfolding around us economically, uh, politically, and socially. So, uh, secondly, having a sense of idealism. Again, we've lost it a little bit. So, what is the ideal society? What should the, the seven billion people on Earth experience? Why should half of them? still plus minus live with less than two dollars uh, a day uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a world that has so much of wealth, so many resources and concentrated in so few hands. And uh, so understanding what is the, the, the kind of new ideal that if you like we need to work towards. Second, the kind of circumstances in which we find ourselves in. Third, identifying a specific area where you could become a change agent and contribute to change, because whether you like it or not, change is happening. The only question is whether you want to participate in it. So, uh, for your generation in 10 to 15 years' time, if not sooner, artificial intelligence is going to take over half your jobs. So already, I don't know if any of you are in the legal profession, uh, the lower rungs of the legal profession are finding themselves in trouble because uh, artificial intelligence-driven uh, let's call it machinery, is drafting legal documents that human beings used to draft. Robots, etc., are taking over. The World Economic Forum is talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Others are, uh, in fact, talking about a future where you must receive uh, an income from the state because you're not going to get an income from a job as we know it today. So how, how do you plan for that future? How do you retrain people who are 45 to 50 years old? when they are confronted by those realities as well. Th these are some of the discussions that have taken place in international fora uh, over the last, say, year or so, in, in a sense. And activism means a commitment to bringing about change in the right way that is socially beneficial, and one which will, in a sense, hopefully foresee some of the future trends that are happening and uh, influence those trends so that they don't negatively impact upon a large percentage of, of humanity. There's been a lot of talk in South Africa about radical um, economic transformation. How do you ensure that this change, like you said, is brought about in the right way for the entire you know, 50 <coughs> million people, rather than just a few? Well, by giving the, firstly the right kind of content to understanding what is it that needs to change. Secondly, what does it need to change to? Thirdly, uh, recognizing that both, let's call it right-wing populism and left-wing populism are uh, important trends that have revived themselves, not only in South Africa, but around the world. In fact, more so in your territory than ours uh, at this point in time, because you can see how that populism is influencing political decisions that citizens make. Uh, today, by the way, is an example of that and uh, the kind of choices that they're making as well, or led into making, <coughs> by virtue of how they, how they find themselves. So in our case, uh, radical, uh, all that radical means for some of us is that it must be change that is changing the fundamental character of our economy. It must be more diverse, it must be more dynamic, it must be able to innovate more, it must be able to absorb young people into jobs of one kind or another, or create an ecosystem that enables them to become uh, entrepreneurs, social or economic entrepreneurs of one kind or another. It must be a system that enables uh, the right kind of, uh, uh, I let's call it lesser inequality to be created. We close the inequality gap, remove the poverty gap, and reduce, I mean, the, the most recent numbers is almost 30% unemployment amongst South Africans who are capable of working. That's a miserable number. But it's a number that has sustained itself in the system in South Africa for a long time. And it's not one that we should continue to have as, as our number, uh, so to speak. The wrong kind of radicalism is what that uh, tells all of you, you will all have 10 hectares of land if you come back to South Africa free of charge. And you can do with it what you like. 
or you can seize other people's property uh, and not compensate them for one, one thing or another. <coughs> but that should also not be used as an excuse not to move. And uh, what we're working hard on now is to build some national consensus uh, on the need to change our country, a luta continua, and uh, remove those fault lines that have appeared that we haven't sorted out, either because we didn't negotiate them in the pre-1994 period. For example, in negotiating our new constitution, we didn't negotiate how would the economy look in the future. Uh, we just wanted a new political system so that once that political system becomes a democratic one, that system would be able to resolve some of these issues. But clearly, you don't uh, change economic balances as, as we thought it might actually happen. So new ways need to be found in terms of how that happens. But at the end of it, the real test is, do 50 million citizens benefit from the changes? Or are you just reinforcing uh, the bank accounts of a small elite? Turning to um, a more wider outlook, in your speech you reference you know, challenges and threats to globalisation and open trade. And we're seeing you know, in all sorts of countries around the world rising tides of protectionism, both in rhetoric and actually in policy. Do you think it's time for a new multilateral commitment to open trade? Yes, but I think uh, one of the challenges is that many of these multilateral instruments are on the one hand good, because multilateralism is the future. On the second hand, or on the other hand, what, what they don't have is a greater respect for inequality in power. So it's the powerful who often dictate the shape of many of these uh, uh, agreements that we actually reach. And if we don't get the right balances, then we open the door to the powerful exercising uh, their prerogative to either pull out of deals, uh, again, you know, with or without a tweet, and, uh, and, and disrupt what, what has been emerging as, as a global system. Uh, and so the test for us, again, is, is uh, leadership which is proactive, leadership which is able to foresee uh, some of these developments quicker than we currently do, and a global uh, system uh, of discussion and negotiation that is more proactive and less sluggish uh, than, than the ones that we have at the moment. Every country will need to protect some other industry or safeguard some other industry. The question is, how do you get the balances right? There's no such thing as free trade. Uh, if you just go below the surface of, of, of the slogan, uh, that's why you have trade agreements, because it actually says, here's my limits, here's your limits, how do you find a compromise? Uh, on which will I sustain high tariffs, on which will I drop tariffs? And am I getting enough out of you, and are you getting enough out of me? That's the, if you put it in simple terms, that's the equation that we're talking about at the end of the day. So sometimes these slogans can become misleading. Um, and, and the only question in the kind of framework that one would work with is, is the product fair? And is it fair to everyone? Because one of the rebalancing exercises, if you like, that we need to do is the balance between developed countries and developing countries. And making sure that developing countries get a fairer share of the bargain that, that, that we are actually uh, getting into. And that becomes uh, the contest that every one of these negotiations results in. Great, thank you. Let's take some questions from the audience now. Um, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please, if you're selected, wait for the microphone to reach you. It will not amplify you, but will record what you have to say. So, first question, let's go to the, the hand in the middle of the, the audience here. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, in your speech, uh, you referenced whether South Africa chooses to adopt uh, global environmental standards. So, I was just wondering what your views on the future of ESCOM, most importantly with regards to renewable energy, whether you think the grid could ever be independently managed and what the impact of the nuclear deal is on its future. Thank you. Lots of questions. Eh? <laughs> do you want to take one at a time or do you want to take two or three at a time? Um, whatever let's, you let's have three at a yeah. time, then it's easier. Okay, sure. Let's go to the hand there by the fireplace. <coughs> Over there. Uh, thank you very much for coming through. and. Uh, and also thank you for the many years of service that you've given to South Africa, both in liberation and in service to the South African government. 
Um, so my question concerns the references that you made to a post-neoliberal uh, state, what that might look like and the kind of thinking that we as people here at Oxford might have to go through in formulating what a post-neoliberal South African state would look like. And one of the questions is, is something like a basic income grant feasible both politically and economically in a country like South Africa? And I'd be very much interested in hearing your perspectives on that. This is something that has recurred in South African discourse, both media in media and to an extent politically, and I'd be very much interested in hearing your perspective. But I came here to listen to yours as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why don't you give me one idea that's in your mind about what that might look like, if you don't mind, with your permission. Chief. Yeah, absolutely. I tend Go to be it. a bit rebellious, so forgive yeah. me. For Give you, gives you more time to think as well. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I'd like to highlight is at least two sort of benefits that could potentially be the come about of uh, come through a, a basic income grant. The first of which is potential savings in administrative costs. We, we do have social, a social grant system that is pretty extensive and benefits a large number of people in South Africa, but it is to an extent more com cumbersome than what a basic income grant would look like, which is a small amount of money given to all citizens of a country, regardless of their income, something that they have essentially a, a guarantee for from the state. Secondly, um, so we recently saw stats that say publish South African first quarter GDP growth rates of contracting by 0.7%. Um, one way to boost aggregate demand would be to have more, simply more money go to consumers which, with higher propensities to consume, which is lower income people. And an argument can be made that a basic income grant would go some ways towards improving aggregate demand in a country like South Africa and bringing about the 1.3% forecasted um, growth rate for this year, which is, I'm not sure if it's going to be achieved, but which, which, which is certainly forecasted. Yeah, so those are two okay. of my ideas. Thank Great, you. thank you. Let's take one further question. Great, okay. Oh, well, right, let's go to the very, the, the very back of the room over there then. Let's see a hand waving. Thank you very much, Chair. Two very short questions, please. Um, as former Minister of Finance, what do you see as South Africa's role regionally in SADC? And two unrelated questions, second unrelated question, the questions of language and diversity. When people come here, we encourage them to learn English. What would you encourage them to learn if they go to South Africa? I think there's a lot for you to be working with there. No, on the question of language, we should be as multilingual as we can be. So, you know, we all live in different parts of the country. There are different languages that are dominant uh, in different parts of the country as far as the vernacular language is concerned. So a combination of English and Isizulu, for example, uh, is what new generations of people must actually learn as we, as we go forward. So that gives you both a sense of rootedness in culture uh, and continuity in culture on the one hand uh, and the development of the language as well, uh, whilst on the other hand, English is still the lingua franca, if you like, globally speaking, uh, and that enables you to sit in fora like this and do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, a role in SADC, well, we, we, we are still the dominant economy on the African continent. So Regional formations like SADC uh, have a couple of things that they could be doing and are doing to some extent. The one is, for example, the tripartite uh, free trade agreement between SADC, ECA and COMESA, which has been worked on for the last two or three years and uh, should be near completion now, which would create uh, an interesting uh, op relatively open market, so it's not completely free, it depends what the trade negotiators come up with, and uh, <coughs> creates uh, greater possibilities for investment on the one hand, uh, but also uh, one of the things that I think we, we are lagging on on the, on the continent, and the current, say the last 18 months or so, has brought that fault line to the fore as well, is that whilst we claim that we want to diversify our economies, we haven't done enough. Um, and uh, again, I've been hearing from some academics and so on, and you don't have to hear it from academics, it's also true that Africa, or, or even the parts that we are talking about, 
are not adequately, if at all, integrated into global value chains. And so we are missing out on the current levels of industrialization and technological developments and so on. So more concentrated effort needs to be put into, into some of those areas. And thirdly, uh, physical integration. Uh, uh, political leaders have been talking about uh, investment in infrastructure on the continent, particularly north, south and east, west, and between our countries for a long time now. There are a few projects, largely in East Africa, that have materialized. The new railway that you've talked to, uh, I'm sure, seen recently in Kenya, uh, and others that are integrating countries in that part of the world. But for the rest, we are too sluggish. It takes too long to get some of these things done. And uh, there's a huge interest in investing in infrastructure on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, Western capital is still reluctant, sees Africa as one country in many instances, rather than 54, and uh, requires some risk mitigation uh, to attract that kind of capital onto the continent as well. But many of the development banks have done some very useful work uh, that could mitigate some of, some of those risks. <coughs> on the question of ESCOM, well, ESCOM is, is, is one of those institutions that uh, is finding itself in the news for the wrong reasons at the moment, as you know, uh, if you're watching it. Uh, CEOs coming and going, boards who, which can't answer questions, uh, deals around coal and other things which are uh, dubious, if I can be polite about those points uh, at this point in time, frankly. And uh, it's, it's a very important institution in South Africa because when ESCOM, for whatever reason, was in difficulty a few years ago and electricity supply was not guaranteed, it had a, almost a one percentage point GDP impact uh, on our economy. So you don't play around with institutions like that. Above all, ESCOM has a state guarantee of 350 billion rands, of which until recently they had used about 200 billion rands and you don't play around with that as well. So some of the recent uh, ratings uh, opinions that we have are uh, raising the profile of the contingent liability of the state, meaning that uh, these uh, guarantees that have been offered constitute contingent liabilities. If there isn't good management and good and tough boards and if financial management is not handled at the right kind of level, then we are risking the possibility of imposition on the fiscus, which is already finding itself uh, in, in, in difficulties as, as well. Now, as a result, you've also got strange decisions being made around whether they sign, uh, as you know, uh, renewables agreements or not. Now, that, that set of projects have brought in about some 200 billion runs of investments uh, into the country, and there's a huge black empowerment element uh, in many of those investments as well. So, <coughs> for, uh, all sorts of arguments are being raised around that and hopefully sooner rather than later uh, we, we create certainty uh, about our direction uh, in respect of renewables. My own view is, is that that nonsense must stop and uh, that we must start doing the right things because renewables is an important component of the energy mix that we want. On, on nuclear, um, there's a lot of talk, but not so much uh, uh, of movement. You, you might be aware that there have been court cases recently that have partly stalled the process as, as well. So what the country will be insisting on is optimal transparency uh, in procurement processes, in financing mechanisms, in the, the costs that are actually involved. Nuclear is part of the overall mix uh, of energy in terms of our integrated resource plan. And we have one nuclear power station anyway in Coburg, uh, in, in, the, in the Western Cape. On the post-neoliberal uh, uh, model, uh, if I had the answer, I wouldn't be coming to Oxford to uh, get the answer from you. But I think essentially what we're saying is that uh, we, we've seen the consequences of uh, a deregulated financial system. Uh, pre-2008-2007. Uh, and there's a risk that we're moving back into that uh, with the Dodd-Frank Act uh, being challenged in, in the uh, American political system as, as well. 
and the biggest banks in the world and those that actually brought the risks to the rest of the world and caused the uh, Great Recession come from there. So what, what, what should the financial system have as the regulatory mechanisms? And we've just learned a whole lot of harsh lessons about capital adequacy, about uh, the kind of uh, regulatory system that we need, both in terms of market conduct and prudential regulations. We're just about to pass laws in South Africa on that. If there's any movement away from the kind of system that we've just created over the last seven or eight years, uh, that, that will be a huge disaster. The second <coughs> um, is, 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 a, is a look at uh, the social system as a whole and uh, how it, it actually generates the current inequality. So there's lots of work done by Professor Piketty, the late uh, Tony Atkinson, I think he was based, was it here in Oxford? Uh, who are arguing that you need to put inequality at the center of public policy making and uh, begin to resolve some of those issues with, with different kinds of models that will generate uh, greater levels of participation and that will obviate uh, some of the points you're making about the basic income grant that we talked about. That same issue will come to us in a different form when you probably get to, uh, not my age hopefully, before my age. <coughs> and where the, the, the work situation and the work environment begins to, to change as well. Uh, the, the third is, is the question of so-called free trade that is in fact balanced in, in, in favor of the big economies of the world and you need a new kind of trade deal. The fourth is the question of sustainable development and the environment and how we deal with that. Now that, that is also being endangered in some of the big economies of the world as well as, as you know. So those will be some examples, <coughs> excuse me, of the kind of uh, system that we're talking about. The social grant system, remember, is not a permanent system. I mean, ultimately, every human being wants the dignity of having the opportunity to work and earn an income. They want the dignity of being able to decide how they want to spend their income. And they want the dignity of having pride in what they do uh, and, and, and looking after their families. So depend, being, de creating an additional dependence on the state is not giving people pride. It's not giving them the dignity that they require. So we need to grow the GDP base of our country and others as well. We need to uh, ensure that people are in a growing economy absorbed in one way or another and are getting a, a minimum wage that we are now able to offer in, in the South African context as, as well. And uh, if in the future different forms of social challenges arise, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of income poverty, then a modification of, of the basic income grant can be uh, visualized at that point in time. Um, the social grant system played an enormous role in lifting people out of poverty, as you correctly point out, and, and creating some level of uh, consumer impact as well. But it's, it's about raising the incomes in, in the pockets of everyone in South Africa and indeed in other parts of the world that will make a real difference at the end of the day. And it's, it's that long-term or medium-term project that uh, we're going to hand over to your generation to take over. Great. Okay, let's take a few more questions. Do we have any more volunteers? Yeah, let's go to the question, um, the hand at the very far end over there and then following that, the um, person with the glasses over there second in. Um, so my question is, do you think there's a future, both economically and politically, for South Africa under the ANC in its current form? I've got a two-part question also. Um, so you talk a lot about... extra charge for two parts. Eh? <laughs> I got it all in Uplang for you. Um, so my you talk a lot about automation and, and the future of, of work and labour markets. Well, how is the South African uh, government and policy makers uh, thinking about uh, automation, artificial intelligence, uh, both from a labor structure, but also from a top-down intellectual pioneer, uh, uh, intellectual perspective where they'd be pioneering these technologies. That's the first part. The second part's much more provocative. Uh, and I'd say, if a young Praveen Gordon, uh, who studied at Oxford, uh, and he looked back into his home country and he saw rampant unemployment uh, state capture, uh, the triple disease burden in healthcare. Uh, 
What, what would make him go back to this country? Okay, great. And we'll take one more question. Um, yeah, <coughs> just directly behind you there on the back row. I was curious to know if you have any thoughts on how President Kagame has managed to achieve such results so quickly in Rwanda and was curious to know if he has any strategies that he has implemented successfully in that country and if you think they can be implemented in your country. Even though you have a very, very different history, are they applicable and would they work? Okay. Um, future of South Africa under the ANC. The Mandela Sisulu Tambo ANC and the values that they've inspired and instilled in the organization, which is what inspired my generation and many generations on either side of my age, is uh, the ANC that still informs its policy positions, not necessarily some of its practices. That's the first point. The second point is that they are still extremely good people within the ANC. And like I said, you, you don't, uh, either in government or out of government or within political formations, as you see around you in the UK as well, walk on a bed of roses. There's contestations at all times, contestation of ideas, whether it's around technology or AI or <coughs> how you grow the economy or whatever the case might be. And, and thirdly, um, that's, that's uh, the question that we're all asking ourselves in the ANC. We know that we have to renew ourselves and change the ANC uh, in line with its stated policy, not, not anything different, and in line with the values that we've inherited over the years, uh, which are still applicable in, in modern day South Africa as, as well. So is there a future for South Africa? Absolutely. We are a country, as I pointed out to you, you only realize that when you come out of South Africa, by the way. You get a very different, even if it's for two days, uh, like myself, uh, you, you get a different perspective. <coughs> Sorry for the coughing. Um, and, and so, uh, we, we are a very young democracy. We are a 23-year-old democracy. You're sitting in what? A hundreds of years old university, let alone democracy. Uh, in, in, in this country. Uh, the U.S. is what, three, four hundred years of, of democracy? I don't want to comment too much on where they find themselves today. Uh, <clears throat> but similarly elsewhere as well. So futures are created by activists, leaders, and the people of a country. It's, it's not predetermined by anybody. You can determine your future. You can shape it any way you like. So it takes us back to the question of the, what kind of activist uh, do you want to be? What kind of change agent do you want to be? What kind of contributor do you want to be uh, to making a 23-year-old democracy into a 40-year-old democracy? And, and that road won't be, as I said, the bed of roses. It's going to be tough. So uh, you, you will hear, as we call it, a lot of noisy debate uh, uh, within the ANC and outside. And, uh, but there's no other organization at the moment that can potentially still earn the respect and the support of the majority of South Africans. There's no other organization that has the same profound commitment to non-racialism and non-sexism as the ANC, as you can see uh, in, in terms of what we've delivered over the last 20 years uh, or, or so. Does that mean everything is perfect? Absolutely not. But the good thing about the ANC, by the way, if you read its policy documents which are on the website, uh, it's quite transparent about its weaknesses. The only challenge is that it doesn't do enough about them. And that's the difference if you take the Rwanda situation, which is that there's a huge determination to implement things. And in implementing them, you could make mistakes, and you learn from your mistakes, and you move on. But the focus is on implementation. Ethiopia is another good example. Every country, by the way, will have some negative element about it. So I'm not saying that there's no negative element. But if you want to draw lessons, there are lessons to be drawn. And South Africa, uh, although we've done a tremendous amount of work, needs to become a lot more implementation focused as well. So to sum up my point around future for South Africa, I mean, South Africa is going to be here for you, your grandchildren as well. The only question is what kind of South Africa? 
And so if you want to ask that question, what are you going to contribute as South Africans? And what are we going to do back home in order to make sure that your grandchildren or children see a very developed, competitive, and respected country, like the preamble of our constitution says, uh, at, at that particular point in time. But it's something that you've got to build, something that you've got to invest in. You, you don't build a business by sitting back. You don't build a social organization by sitting back. It's hard work to build things. By the way, it, it takes uh, a long time to build things. It takes a very short time to destroy something. Right? So you can build a nice association here, put the wrong leader here in this chair, and you can mess, mix up, you can mess up the Oxford Union tomorrow. And it'll earn a, a, a lousy reputation for a short while. I'm not sure whether in its history it's done that, but you can confess that later. Um, in terms of intellectual uh, contribution on automation and AI and so on, we have a ministry and a department of science and technology, and we have some very good institutions in the CSIR uh, and other, uh, the Medical Research Council and so on. And all of them are doing excellent work. I don't think we market them well enough. Uh, we don't commercialize them well enough, which is another fault line of ours. Good ideas uh, happen in South Africa, but the commercial benefits go out to elsewhere in the world. And they're good enterprising South Africans that are sitting everywhere. Uh, and you run into them, whether it's in the UK or the US or in other parts of the world as well. And we need to find a way <laughs> of being uh, more cohesive on our own side, uh, but also to take ownership. I mean, nobody else grows rooibos, right? <laughs> but there were attempts to steal the uh, intellectual property rights uh, of products like that. So there, there are lots of things that, going, that are going for us, which if we're a little bit better organized than we are, and I know that my former colleague, Naledi Pando, puts a lot of energy into, into this area. So have a look at it. I, 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 I confess I don't know the details, but there's, there's a fair amount of investment. We might, we might not be Silicon Valley yet. But uh, we could do better at creating, and I think these are beginning to happen, where technology hubs are being created, startup hubs are being created, but perhaps not at the speed and at the scale that we require uh, to do justice to our own country and the young people who are enterprising and, and uh, innovating. Uh, a young me, and when I see uh, those uh, things that you've actually described, well, we, I saw it when I was young as well. Eh? Uh, I could have come to Oxford or whatever and uh, made a life elsewhere, like many hundreds of thousands of activists over, over the years. And we, we chose a different route. And the route we chose is not only making the observation that there are challenges, but beginning to become activists who will change those situations uh, and make a difference uh, to our environments. And, and making a difference pre-1994 uh, was quite a risky business. So, you know, you've got to be ready for the security police to knock on your door at 4 o'clock in the morning, get ready to spend three to five months in a solitary confinement police cell and interrogate it every other day and so on and so on. That doesn't happen today in, in the free South Africa. So an activist today lives in a very different climate. Uh, there are many activists who left the country, lived in camps in Tanzania, in Uganda, in Angola, can you imagine their lives and the 10 or 15 years that they spent in those sorts of situations out of a pure commitment to creating a freer South Africa so that the current generations could actually enjoy that, let alone the 26 and 27 years that Ahmad Kathrada and Nelson Mandela and others uh, spent in prison uh, to give us the country that we have today. The challenge, I think, for us is that we forget that history too quickly uh, and the kind of sacrifices that have been made to get us to where we are. I don't think the older generation wants any uh, indebtedness <laughs> or acknowledgement, but understanding our history is very important. So that A, we don't repeat it in, in different forms, but B, that we build on the strengths of our history as well as, as, a, as, a, as a country. So I would certainly go back, to put it simply, and uh, see what I can do, both for myself, for the family I want to have, uh, and for the country and society that I can actually contribute to. And nothing stops you from visiting Oxford for another two years to do whatever you want to do uh, during that period of time. But give something to the country so that uh, you can make a difference in, in, that, in that kind of situation. Uh, on, on Rwanda, 
And uh, as I said earlier, if there's a lesson, it's about the determination to implement things <coughs> and get things going. So if you look at uh, registering a business, starting a business, uh, the kind of investment climate that they seem to be creating, if I take it at, in my discussions with my former colleague there, uh, all of those are important lessons. We say those things in South Africa, and to an extent we've done some of them as, as well, uh, but there's no doubt that Rwanda is, is, is a pace setter. But they're not at our level of sophistication at the same time as, as, as well. Uh, but yeah, one must have the humility to learn as, as well and acknowledge one's weaknesses and do something about them rather than just acknowledge them as well. Great, thank you. Well, unfortunately, that's um, all we've got time for in this meeting today. Um, if I could ask you to please remain seated while the speaker leaves the room. But please join me in thanking Mr. Gordon for coming to speak to us here today. Thank you.